Good afternoon, and welcome to Mile High Con. Uh, my name is Frank Dorchak. I go by F.P. Dorchak. I write novels. Um, these, these fine people to my right also do the same thing. I'm moderating. Uh, I'm going to let them all introduce themselves, and we'll just start into this. Hi, I'm Christine Catherine Rush. I write novels and all kinds of other stuff. I also write a blog every week on the publishing industry, um, which I've been doing mostly on, but I'll say on and off, for about six years. So I guess I'm kind of sort of qualified for the Hi, I'm Christy Helbig, and I am a young adult science fiction and fantasy author, and these are my first two books. Um, I have some more coming out this year, so thanks for having me. I am Angie Hodak. I work at Nelson Literary Agency. I'm the Contracts and Royalties Manager there uh, for Agent Kristen Nelson. And I am Gary Jonas, and I write mostly urban fantasy and some science fiction. Okay, so the title of this is Exploding the Myths of the New World of Publishing. By the way, can you hear me okay, or am I sounding too... Okay, good. I can't tell. So let's start off with... Uh, Publishing and indie or self-publishing being the throes of transition, do any of the old rules still hold, and if so, which ones? Oh, well, first of all, um, when it comes to publishing, there's traditional publishing, which is the stuff all of us, I think, in the room grew up with. Um, and then there's indie publishing, which is somewhat different. That means that you probably have an independent press, even if you're just one person, you're hiring other people. And self-publishing means you do it all. Um, are things different? Yes. Are they drastically different? Eh, a lot of publishing rules still apply. I think the biggest difference is, in my personal opinion, is that writers can go directly to the readers, and the readers are the end consumer in the first place. So, you know, a lot of traditional publishing houses have forgotten that. And a lot of traditionally published writers have forgotten that because they had to sell to their editors first in order to get to the readers. And I think that's the biggest difference, and it causes kind of communication differences between writers who are mostly indie published and writers who are mostly traditionally published. Yeah, one thing I would say, and they, these are traditionally published, however, I'm also self-publishing, and so I think there's a lot less of the um, one is better than the other. I think there are pros and cons to, well, everything in the world, but with publishing it's true as well. And so to look at your own goals, and listen to everybody up here, but look at your own goals and go from there. I actually personally think a hybrid model works really well, where if you traditionally publish some and self-publish some. And with the indie publishing, it is. You are doing everything, even if it means hiring people to do some of that, but I think the stigma for that has really decreased and gives you a lot of control. And I personally have some control issues and like doing everything myself. So um, it's a great fit for some people and some people maybe not as much, but the, the beauty of it is you can still hire out for things that you're not wanting to do or comfortable doing. I want to ask how many of you in the audience have a, do any, does anybody have a traditionally published book? And how about independently? Good, okay, that, that's kind of what I expected. And good for you guys, that's, uh, like has already been said, you, you have a direct line to the, to the, to the readers. I think um, it's correct. This is a really exciting time to be an author because you can do things yourself. Um, Christy mentioned the hybrid model. So that's people who are traditionally publishing, but they're also self-publishing some things on the side. And from an agency perspective, um, my caution to you is make sure that if you want to be a hybrid author, that your agent knows that. There are some agents that don't want to work with hybrid authors, so that's a conversation to have if you receive an offer of representation. And also make sure that your agent uh, negotiates for you knowing that you want to be a hybrid author because uh, if you sign some of the big five publishers boilerplate contracts, you could be signing away your right to independently publish. Um, some of those contracts have really sneaky clauses that those, those uh, publishers will be owning everything you write uh, from there on out, or at least have the, first, the right of first refusal. So if you want to be a hybrid, make sure that's in your contract. 
you beat me to it. That was one of the things I was going to say. Uh, we dealt with that just a little bit. I sold a book to 47 North, a friend of mine wrote, and they did have a, a clause in there that our next project would go to them. So it prevented me for a short time of getting something out on my own where I went more full indie. So I did have to get them something that they could look at. And I was able to withdraw that. They only had it for 30 days, so it wasn't that big a deal, but it, it is something to pay attention to. And if you're writing a series for one of the traditional publishers, you might just say, you get the first refusal on the next book in this series. Yeah, I was going to say, that's what my agent did was the next book in this series. And she also totally changed the reversion of rights clause to make it super tight. So yeah, and absolutely, one of the benefits of an agent, even if you do indie publish, is the negotiation of um, you know, foreign translations, film rights, things like that. So it, it still can benefit you to have an agent unless you love doing that stuff yourself, which I don't. Quite frankly, and I'm sorry, because I'm here with Kristen Nelson's agency, um, I see no point in having an agent anymore. Um, now there's such a thing as the internet and people contact you through the internet. I was traditionally published for 25 years. I am still a hybrid writer. Um, I, once I stopped having an agent handle my foreign and film translations, I have sold more options. I have licensed more books overseas. I have had way more success than I ever did being agented. And I'll tell you this, I was repped by Nora Roberts' agent. I was repped by other agents, big, big, big firms and a couple of small firms. And it didn't change all the way along. But I do want to agree with you on something that I think is quite important. And it, it, uh, if you need to negotiate contracts, yes, absolutely. You have to have help negotiating a contract. But guys, that's what lawyers are for. Um, there are literary attorneys. And Laura Resnick has a um, list on her blog of literary attorneys that you should you should look for, or you can email me, and, and I will definitely send that to you. Those are the ones that we both have vetted. Um, it's just it's a different world, and there you are exactly right about contract terms. It's not just reversion clauses and option clauses. I have seen contracts because of my blog where people actually have to get approval. These are do not compete clauses, and they actually have, and they're often buried in the warranty. It's getting into the weeds here, but the warranty basically says, I warrant that I will not lie with somebody. I warrant that I will not write another book for anybody except you. I warrant that I will do this. It's really sneaky and it's really nasty. And what the do not competes mean, it means um, if they are a blanket one, you can't write anything. You can't write home to mother if mom's going to publish your letter without their approval. And I've seen clauses like that. So you do need help somewhere negotiating a contract. Plus, let me just put out a plug for a, a book out of Nolo Press called The Copyright Handbook, because you need to understand copyright. That's what you sell. You actually license it. And if you don't understand what it is, it doesn't matter if you have the best agent in the world. It doesn't matter if you have the best lawyer in the world. It's your name on that contract. And if there's a mistake in that contract, you're the person who signed it. You're the person who agreed to it. They didn't. So make sure you understand what's in it. And that'll take time, because publishing contracts are 15 to 25 pages long. So you've got to learn it. I'm going to jump in and, and validate your point. Um, but I do think that you have somewhat of a luxury of having a really long history already in this industry and having, a, having built an audience for several years. And I think one of the new realities of publishing is uh, that debut authors struggle with uh, discoverability. Um, and because you're now putting out one book of three million that Amazon is publishing every year. So um, that is one thing that, that agents do for you is if they get you a traditional deal, you have a little bit better chance of getting some distribution that's very challenging to get if you're independent. Um, but I, you made another point that I wanted to agree with and now I can't remember. Do not compete. Yes, non competes. Um, we have a friend who signed a boilerplate contract and gave up all rights to the world and the characters. So not only um, was this person not allowed to write a single word, um, but could no longer even write a novella with her world and characters or you know, kind of a, a marketing piece to give away to her fans, that kind of thing. So be very careful. And this is not a new thing, guys. I mean, this happened to Tony Hillerman 25 years ago. This, you know, but it used to be a Hollywood thing. Now traditional publishers are, the big five in particular, are owned by media conglomerates, so they have Hollywood level contracts. 
That's why I say you really got to start understanding this stuff. It's very important. Okay, that's a good discussion. Um, to follow up on that, there was some stuff said in there along the lines of indie versus traditional authors making your market work. So how do you, you still here? Mm -hmm. so, how, so how do you look at it for indie authors making, making, making a wave in the traditional publishing world? Harder, easier, about even depending on their abilities to promote and market themselves? Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm not sure. I totally understand the question on that, but I'll... I'll okay, well, right now, you, for traditional people, the book companies will put out some promo. They'll, they'll do not something. Really. They'll, they'll put, it, <laughs> put out something. Indies, nothing's put out unless you do it. So indies are going out there trying to make their mark in a world that's already having marks made for them, either by a, a known name, a known publishing house, or an interview on Oprah. Well, you have to build it. You know, it's it's a simple thing. You have to find a way to get people to find your stuff, and so you find ways to promote it. And that can be, you know, once you have, of course, a lot of these things, you have to get enough reviews on the books in order to get something like BookBub is a phenomenal thing to use. You get a lot of sales. I know Chris just had it promoted by them, and I had one. Well, you just had one the other day that went through there. Uh, well, you were with Dreamlord, right? Yeah, it was on Monday. I'm just, yeah. uh, it's, I'm still feeling the halo effect. I didn't have a look since I started traveling, but yeah. Yeah, and, and I had one back in, in September that just exploded my September month, so that was oh, amazing. Okay. BookBub is a promotional site, and they have, I don't know how many subscribers, just tons and tons of subscribers, hundreds of thousands. And you, like Modern Sorcery, which is one that I, I did a, a free giveaway on, this is actually I'll explode another myth right here. You, this is a mass market paperback. This was done through CreateSpace. Um, using the custom sizing, I was able to put out a mass market paperback. So you can do those. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Modern Sorcery was done as a freebie on uh, September 1st. We gave away 28,000 copies, actually more than 28,000 copies. And that led to thousands of sales on my other books. And because I have a series. And that's how you get the discoverability is through a series, ideally. If you are putting out books consistently, they will get found if they're quality. You have to have professional covers, you have to have professional editing, um, all these sorts of things that you have to do in order to measure up just on quality levels, and people will find them. It's amazing. Do you think it's harder for indie authors or on par between that and traditional? Uh, yes, with the effort to be found. I think it's probably about the same, really. I don't think, if you're a new author and you put a book out through a traditional publisher, they will put your book in some bookstores, but they're gonna, you're gonna have one book spine out in Barnes & Noble, in maybe even the wrong section. I don't know. <laughs> how, how easy is that to find? You still have to, you're still doing the work yourself, if you're traditional, or if you're doing it indie. You're I, still the one who has to get the, the discovery. I just wanna say I completely agree with him. I feel like um, I had to do everything myself. <laughs> And I, and I am traditionally published, and I feel like everything that happened to me, speaker-wise and everything else, was because I went out and, and got it. I don't feel like um, that that much is done, you know, unless you're one of their lead list titles, in which case then they do throw some advertising your way, but it's almost like then it's set up that that book has... Why do they need it, right? Right, exactly. So I, I do, I completely agree. I think so much, regardless, is on the author. It's up to the author to do the publicity. Things like book pub, book pub and things like that are great and easier if you're an indie author. And so I actually feel like I, I will have more options with the things I have coming out next being indie. She's right, you do have a lot more options, but it's, it's because the world has changed. This is where the old world and the new world are different. In the old world of publishing, um, publishers did the same thing to promote stuff for 50 years. And then, um, you know, things started changing. There was a lot more television, a lot more movies, a lot more gaming and everything else. Bookstores kind of contracted. And see, so what they used to do is they put the books in the trade channels, and that would be advertising enough. I mean, we've all walked into bookstores and discovered an author who's new to us. Wow, look at that book. Grab it because of the cover. It was great discoverability. Well, there's fewer bookstores these days, I hate to say it, although the indies are growing, thank heavens. Um, and, you know, so there's less ability to have that kind of discoverability. Traditional publishers were slow on the uptake, on realizing that the world had changed and that they had to do new promotions. 
It wasn't until this year that I actually saw the book bug came out of uh, the self and indie published movement. It was somebody got an idea to start a newsletter and off it went and they started making money off of doing it. And it has only been this year that I started to see traditionally published books through their publisher come through BookBub, which is a problem for the writer, speaking of rights and everything else, because often those books are what's called deep discounted, and often deep discounted books don't pay royalties to the author. So you could do a, have your publisher do a BookBub and you know sell 2,000, 5,000 copies on that BookBub and get no money, or you can do it yourself and sell 2,000 to 5,000 copies and get all the money. It kind of makes a little more sense to me to do it the other way. But you have to be willing to learn and to work and to do this stuff. And so what I often tell writers, because I never know where writers are coming from, we're all different, we all have different careers, we all have different goals, is if you want to publish a book every now and then, if you want to be a hobbyist writer, if you really want to be a writer but you want to continue like Jeff Landis does, his high-level NASA career, or you want to be a professor, or you want to do something else, go traditional. They'll do it for you. They'll make you do occasional stuff. But really, that's the best way to go. If you want to have a career as a writer, you either have to be hybrid or you have to be indie. Because first of all, you'll make more money. And you want to have a career, what do you do when you, make, when you do a career? You make a living. So you go to the path that's going to help you make a living. It means it's a harder path. It means you do a lot more work. You have to learn all the aspects of the business as opposed to, you know, the writing aspect. But, you know, you have choices now. And I think that's the best thing about this new world, is we all have choices. I think, too, that um, the number one message should be write a good book. So in independently publishing, remember that for every author who earned $500,000, there are 500,000 authors who earned $1. Um, and I think there's, there's sour grapes about agents and editors and publishers uh, because there's rejection and that feels very personal, right? Um, but keep in mind, you know, the, oh, they're the gatekeepers, they're the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are the readers. And no matter how you reach the readers, that's who's going to decide if, you're, if you have a successful career as a writer. So um, write a good book is number one before you start worrying about how you're going to promote it, or what your website's going to look like, or you know what your business cards uh, say on them, that kind of thing. Write a good book. I'll top her with that. I will top you. Not don't just write a good book before you even start thinking about promoting your any book. Write five. I mean, and if you're going to publish a bunch, if you're going to indie publish, you shouldn't start promoting until your tenth book. There's nothing to promote. Exactly what you you were saying with the book club. You have a series. You had. That you may get 10,000 sales on your book bub if it was for free, or whatever, however you did it, but if you don't have books to follow up, I mean, what's the first question you guys ask as readers? Where's the next one? Where's the next one? Exactly. So make sure there's a next one before you start promoting the first one. And boy, you're golden after that. If you wrote a good book, we are on the exact same page there. And in fact, if you write a great book, boy, they're really going to climb up for the next one and tell all their friends about it, too. That's the best way to have discoverability is word of mouth. So do you think that books, uh, books have to be perfect to sell? And by perfect, I mean including uh, plot issues, structure issues, grammatical issues. Grammatical, you need, to have a, you need to have a nice looking product. You're selling a product. So, you know, you need to have a great cover. You need to have all the interior look good. You don't have to spend a lot of money to do it. There are, there are companies like Lucky Bat Press that will allow you a menu of services. So if you don't feel like you can design a cover, I certainly can't. Um, you could go and have one of their cover designers do it. Everybody needs a copy editor. Everybody needs a line editor. Um, so you need all of that. But um, a perfect book, after all of this is over, when we get later in the day, somebody pull me aside and maybe we'll sit around round robin and I will tell you what is wrong with every single play I've ever seen of Shakespeare's. I will tell you why those things aren't perfect. I will give you the round robin clarion critique. My favorite is Midsummer Night's Dream. I will tell you how that is just awful and where it screws up and what good old Will should do to fix it. So therefore, no, I don't think you can ever have a perfect product. You just have to have a really heartfelt product that makes people feel better. That being said, um, if you've ever picked up or looked through an indie book that has typo after typo on the first few pages, 
that person is going to put it down and your name as an indie author is your brand. And so if your brand is right off the bat with your first product, someone might pick your book up. You could pay for the best cover in the world. And I do. So if you're going to put money into two things, put it into the cover and into editing. And don't skimp and, and do a good job. But your brand is you. So you want, especially the editing, where you want it as clean as possible. You can go into any bookstore and pick up any traditionally published book, and you will find a typo, most likely, somewhere in that book. It just is. So your goal isn't to be perfect, or you will never put a book out there. You want to get a product out there, but you want to make it the best that you can, and that always takes eyes other than yours, no matter how good you are. You need somebody else's eyes on that book first. And to build on that, I just want to point out, there are a lot of traditionally published books that have never been edited. Yeah, yeah there's a bunch of them. Under various pen names, sadly. We have, a we, have a, we have a question here. Is it JT? Yes, you got it. Yes. So uh, along the lines of what you've been talking about, regardless of the route you go to get published, would hiring a publicist on your own with your own money help? I got no. Bitch. <laughs> yeah, you got such a hard no because um, I know people who've hired publicists. I know how much they cost. Um, a good publicist is going to take. Um, anywhere from $3,000 a month to $5,000 a month of your money. And they're, you're not going to be their only client. And they're not going to know, often they don't know the book industry, they don't know it really well, they're not going to be able to help you. They're not going to know what to do. And they, I, I've never known anyone who has hired a publicist who has a book only where that's worked. Now I know people who have had like TV series come out based on their books and then they hire a publicist and then the publicist will get them on, you know, Good Morning America and stuff and it'll actually make a difference. But you, the writer, if you go on Good Morning America and you don't have a movie or TV tie-in, it's not going to bump your book sales. It just isn't. So, you know, the publicist will go the wrong direction for you at the wrong point in your career. It's a good question, but it's just not going to help. So you got to write the good book. Just concentrate on writing the next book. If you control anything, that's what you can control. If anyone else has questions, feel free to raise your hand. Okay, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, we have all know about Amazon and some of these other um, clearing houses. What impact do they have on selecting a publisher or not going into or any of that stuff to get your book out into I'll say the mass market out there. What impact does Amazon have on getting your books out to the mass market? Yeah. That's a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to ebooks, which is about 20 to, the, the numbers vary depending on who you believe. It's 20 to 35% of the market, okay? Of, of, in the United States, we're talking about in the United States only right now. Um, when you put out an ebook by yourself, or when you put out an ebook through a traditional publisher, you go to the same markets. It doesn't matter. Um, if you start talking worldwide, then you start talking about licensing of rights and all that stuff that's just neighbory right now. But um, the difference is, as an indie, you can, in English, you can get into, as an ebook, you can get into the worldwide markets. Your book may not be available because of your contract you signed if you went traditionally published um, worldwide. So, right there, it's kind of an unequal field. But when it comes to paper, and every uh, tradition, or indie published and hybrid writer should have a paper book, um, it's a little different. It depends on what services you select and how you do it. Every single paper book, if you do it correctly, it doesn't matter if you publish it or a traditional publisher publishes it, will go into the what's called the distribution system, which is Ingram's, Baker, Taylor, and all of those places book depository overseas, every place like that, they will go in. The difference is the amount of promotion that you get through that distributor, all right? Which, is, it takes some tricks, but it, again, the, the um, line is, is equal, except that traditional publishers are used to going through that channel. So if I publish through Bantam Books tomorrow, my book will automatically go into that channel at a higher level than if I do it myself, unless I goose it myself which I can do. See, it's all available, it's just the amount of work. It's, it's so, you know, there's good on both sides, good on, on, you know, good and bad on either side. I think a writer's 
work should be available to as many people as possible. And I actually think that's where most indie writers make a mistake. They only go to Amazon, which is one bookstore, which is the biggest bookstore in the United States, but not the biggest bookstore worldwide. And they automatically limit themselves. I think that's a huge mistake. Um, traditional publishers, on the other hand, are limited you know, by the rights that they have acquired. And there's all these problems. So if you're spending most of your time worried about where your book is going to be at, there's better things to worry about you know, as a writer, just learning craft, getting better, becoming a better writer, doing that, and putting your books out to the best of your ability, whatever it is. And I think there's two schools of thought where Amazon is concerned. We represent Hugh Howie, who wrote the Wall series, um, who is Amazon's biggest champion, right? I mean, that's how he got discovered, is through self-publishing on Amazon. And uh, so he's a big Amazon champion. And then you have all the people who are saying, Amazon is the devil, Amazon is not your friend. Yeah. Um, what's really, fr and I, I have several friends who have really, have had, if some of our clients, our hybrid authors, have had really great success on Amazon, but then they did Amazon Unlimited. So Amazon is always behind the scenes doing this, right? Um, you, you sign up in their Unlimited program, and it's like, hey, author, be exclusive to us, and we'll give you better, a better royalty rate which is actually a consignment fee, not a royalty, but we can go into that later. Um, the problem is that if you are part of, kin of uh, the Kindle Unlimited program, you will have better discoverability than all of the people who have decided to diversify. So your metadata automatically makes you discoverable, but it pins you into Amazon. So then you have to kind of start making those decisions too. So be informed, um, Amazon is a corporation. Yeah, they're not your friend and they don't hate you. They're, they're just a business. Let me add to Which the is just like any other publisher out there. Yeah, yeah. And let me add to the Kindle one thing. Um, if you go exclusive on Kindle Unlimited, it also limits your upper end. So if you end up writing a book that becomes the next big bestseller, they don't pay you commensurate at the upper end. It's only in the middle where you make more money. It's not above. So, you know, you know, why limit yourself? They call themselves unlimited, but it's really Kindle limited, guys. It is, but I'm going to play devil's advocate just a little bit because there are a couple of occasions where Kindle limited can be beneficial, not as a strategy, but as a tactic. And that is, if you already have traction on Amazon and you do not have traction on any of the other sites, you can make a lot more money going Kindle unlimited, but I do not stay there. That's the key because you want to be wide, you want your stuff available around the world. I agree with Chris 100% on that, but I will also say that I did the Kindle Unlimited thing, and I still have some books that are Kindle Unlimited and some that are wide, and eventually everything will be wide, but I was making $30 a month from all the other sites combined, and when they did this new paying by the page, I went into that, and then that $30 turned into $3,000, and it was even more, it's been more than that since then. So. You know, even as the, the page rate drops, and it will, this is going to drop and they're going to change it. And so you always, if you do it, be informed. And if you don't have discoverability there now, it, going Kindle Unlimited, if you have like a million sales rank, it's not going to change anything. So don't do it. Stay wide. And if you already have any traction wide, if you're making a decent amount of money, don't do it. But if you have traction in one place and none anywhere else, then, okay, it's three months. Why not? I love the word he used. He used the best possible word when you're talking about promotion. He used two of them, actually. Strategy and tactics. I mean, that's what you're doing when you're trying to promote something. You need to come up with a strategy before you even start, and then you need to decide what your tactics are. And if you do that, I don't care how you promote your book. It's just, you're going to figure out what's best for that particular book. Not what's best for your entire career and all of your books, but that particular book at this particular time. What tool is the best possible tool to get me discovered? There's a lot of new stuff that you guys need to be thinking about as writers. And it's, it's kind of fascinating, but it's overwhelming at the same time. Let me just simply say it can be learned. One of the reasons I've been writing this blog so long is that when the new world of publishing started in, I realized I didn't know a whole bunch of stuff, that, and a lot of the stuff I did know was out of date. So I just started blogging about it. And what I was learning is what my readers were learning. And I know a lot more about it now than I did, but I'm still learning. Like, I'm looking over at Gary's books at the mass market size going, how in the world did you do that? See, that's how I learned. Yeah, I'm wondering if we will talk later. 
And, and also, because you mentioned Hugh Howey, I also have to say something, because Hugh Howey went all in on Kindle Unlimited, he, and he says he doubled his income. However, he lost all of his traction everywhere else. I think that was a huge mistake on his part. I would never have done that, even if he's making more money from it. That was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Chris, you mentioned earlier that, okay, so there's, there's create space in paperback books. So where else would you recommend someone going beyond, besides create space for creating paperback books? Well, you guys have to realize that I've been in this business for over 30 years, and I used to own a small and independent press. Um, back before all this stuff happened. So it was in the 90s I had one. And so it, it, getting paper books is not mysterious to me. You guys can go down the road here somewhere in Denver. I'm sure there's companies that will produce a paper book for you. Um, you can pay what you, the difference between Create Space and some of these print on demand sites and the other ones is the other ones you have to pay up front for your 5,000 copies. Create Space came in, it was lovely because it did. Can do print on demand and it made it easier. The other one is Ingram Spark. Do not, do not, do not go with Lightning Source. That's the one you used to. Their contracts make no sense and, in fact, reference things that don't even exist anywhere. So, you know, and they also have the right to change it at any moment. So, go to Ingram Spark if you want hardcover. That's going to be more expensive. Uh, create Space is you get paid every time you produce, or you have to pay them every time you produce a book and it gets folded into the whole thing. So it's, it's really simple to produce the book. To design a paper book is not simple. It's hard and it takes a learning curve. So you will need help with that and learn how to do it. But, um, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities and I'm sure there's a million of them I don't even know about because paper books really aren't hard to produce. Uh, independent and small press, regional presses and college presses have been producing paper books for a very, very, very long time. I just want to second the Ingram Spark recommendation. Um, I know multiple indie authors and the nice thing about them is they also have a lot of distribution, so getting you in catalogs as an indie author, we're doing that. Um, a group of us are doing an anthology together and we're using Ingram Spark for the paperback distribution. Also check with your library system. I live just south of here and our library system now takes indie books in the library system. And he worked with um, Mark from Smashwords, Mark Coker, on having that be an availability through Smashwords as, because it wasn't before. So you, it's always going to be changing, so you're never going to be like, oh, that's what Amazon's doing. Okay, it's going to change. So just know that you need to constantly keep on top of things. Right now, I'm saying Ingram Spark is great for paper distribution. That could change a year or two from now. So you have to kind of just stay, read blogs. Like, her blog is amazing, The Business Rush. Um, you want to read blogs like that. Jay Conrad has a lot of good articles and Dean Wesley Smith. Um, stay on top of the current resources and, and read about the industry because if you're an indie publisher, you are a business person. You are not just an author. You have to always remember that. Well, the thing you have to remember is I don't care what you do, whether you go traditional or not. As an author, you're a small business person. I've been saying this for 25 years. You are running a business, and you need to understand that business. The reason writers get screwed so badly is that they always think of themselves as an author, and they produce art. Now, frankly, I produce art too, um, but you know, I also learned the business. So just make sure you learn the business. The difference between when I came in the business 30 years ago and right now is everything. She's exactly right. Everything is changing, and it's changing fast. And so, what's true today on this panel? If you quote me what I say on this panel. Two years from now, some of it will be great, and some of it will be like, what the heck, was she smoking something at the time? You know, because it all changed so fast. It was such a stable industry, and it's such an unstable industry right now. You have to keep up. Just to touch on the Ingram Spark thing one more time, because I would say use both Create Space yep. and yes. Ingram Spark, because if you have an, an ISBN for your company, then you can you know, use the same file you send one to Create Space. That way it's available with it immediately, always in stock on Amazon. And then for all the other places, and bookstores will order it if it's through Ingram Spark. They also can Create order Space. through Create Space. Right. They can. They yes. can. And, and right. bookstores can and do through Create Space. So there's two different distribution networks. And that so, works yeah. really well. His advice is great. You mentioned the volatility of things right now ebooks versus paperback books. I read an article online, um, it was 
about two weeks ago, maybe longer, about how ebooks were declining in popularity over paperbacks. And I think this was actually a UK article, so I don't know how it was worldwide. Was it The Guardian? That sounds right. I think yeah. it was The Guardian. Okay. Uh, basically, what they're talking about is they're talking about the um, traditional publishers, the big five, because what happened is they got back to agency pricing, they raised the prices on ebooks, so their sales went down. Imagine that. They're charging, you know. $9.99 or $12.99 for an ebook when you can get the paperback for the same price or the hardcover, which is a little bit more with all the discounts. Why would you do an ebook if you get the hardback for the same price? Doesn't make sense. You can then take your hardback and sell it to a used bookstore and you get your, some of your money back. You can't do that with an ebook. So, um, but when it comes to the indies, the indie part is still growing. And that's what they like to leave out. And so I recommend going to a site called authorearnings.com. That's one that Hugh Howey and a guy named Data guy put together. And so study that they have all sorts of charts and, and things there and it's amazing when you look at it and understand that they're using they, they recently did something where they went to like Kobo and, and, and Barnes and Noble and some other places Apple but most of this stuff is primarily Amazon it's a snapshot of what it was on that particular day so keep that as a caveat and on the other side of that um, so he always one of our clients one of our other clients is Courtney Milan who is um, She's been a traditionally published author. She's now making a killing as an independently published author. And every time Hugh Howie publishes something on author earnings, she rebuts it. She um, tears apart this, the statistics and the methodology. She's a lawyer as well as an author, extremely smart. She used to be a, a, a clerk for one of the Supreme Court justices. She's smart as a whip. I mean, that's part of why she's making so much money is because she's running her business daily. Um, but it's, it's it, point counterpoint. If you're an author earnings fan, then hop on over to Courtney Malone's blog and read what she has to say too. Questions? Audiobooks are they part of the new world of publishing? Audiobooks are part of the old world of publishing and the new world of publishing. If um, ebooks had not gone through this huge change and hadn't side, you know, hadn't impacted the, the business as bigly as bigly. Oh, Chris! Wow, I've been traveling. I mix my living with boys. Um, as, as <laughs> yeah, you know, large as as they have. Um, then the big story of this century would be audiobooks because the increase in the amount of audiobooks has been huge. Um, they went from something like 1% of the market to something like 15 to 20% of the market. It's huge. Um, and they are uh, a market that you need to get into. It's, it, as an indie writer, um, if you have a runaway book, the, the audio companies will come to you, but otherwise you have to approach them. Audible makes it easy by going through their ACX service. Um, but it's never easy because you need to be able to, they prove what's going on, you need to have a narrator, you either need upfront money or you need to be able to work with somebody. It's, thought, it's very time consuming. All of this is time consuming. So you have to look at it. Right now, Audible is the big kahuna online, and, but that may change right now. Germany is going after um, Audible for being so exclusive. So who knows what's gonna happen. As I said, everything is changing, but audiobooks, yeah, they're great. And it's growing. It's growing market. Oh yes, Aaron Michael Ritchie. Gary, do you have uh, do you have uh, audio books? Yes, I do. <laughs> did you do the upfront or did you do the price sharing with the narrator? Okay, one of them that I did has a royalty share that I did through ACX, and then the others that are out. I had uh, been with a smaller publisher, and in order to get my rights back so that I could put my books out myself because I wasn't making any money, I worked a deal where they got to keep the audio rights, she wouldn't let go of those, so I said, all right, fine, you keep the audio rights. If, I don't, if you don't do anything with them in two years, I get them back. And so she's managed to get uh, two books out so far, and it looks like two more will be coming out. But then the guy who did um, Akron Highway, which is the second of the Jonathan Shea books, he did a good job. So I talked to him, he's going to do the rest of the books on that series. So that way I got a, a good narrator, I already have them lined up. You know, another thing um, that I'm reminded of, and I, I hope I'm not changing the subject, but in talking about um, partnering and doing kind of cool things, um, have you heard of Kindle Worlds? So any fanfic writers? Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> 
So there are authors now who are licensing their worlds for, to Kindle Worlds, and that allows you as a fan fiction writer to write in their world with their characters, and you make money and they make money, um, which is really kind of fun. So Hugh Howey um, has his world open to Kindle Worlds, and one of our other clients who wrote some kind of really fun, like, cozy mysteries back in the uh, early 2000s, all her books are out of print. But we just put her on Kindle World, and she's making like four thousand dollars a month, just because fanfic people loved her world so much that they're writing stories in her world. So it's kind of a fun opportunity. And I, two of my really good friends actually are author indie authors are doing that and making a lot of money through Kindle Worlds. So if that's something you're into, I definitely think it's worth exploring for sure. And the choice you have to make as a writer is pretty simple. Um, if you're if you licensing the world, you want to make sure it's okay for somebody else to play in your sandbox. Um, and if you're going to go play in the sandbox of somebody who's read Star Trek and Star Wars, which is, I'm sorry, it's fanfic licensed by Paramount, that's all it is. Um, you know, you have to make sure that you are being true to the world. And they will, generally speaking, kind of monitor to make sure you are being true to the world. So you have, you can't, you know, take Spock and suddenly make him emotional and make him run all over, you know, the galaxy solving crimes. Um, you know, as interesting as that may be, you might want to call him Spec or something instead of Spock. But you can't do it in their world. So you just you make sure that when you fanfic writing, it can't be wild and crazy fanfic. It's going to have to be within certain limits. But wow, it is a great opportunity for, for fanfic writers and for writers who have a series that opens. Uh, when you do that, uh, do they advertise your name or do they take all the credit and rights? You have your name on it usually. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we get the rights go to the author. The, the the license holder owns the rights. You don't own the rights. Okay, I don't own any rights, but at least I tell people who I am. Right. Yeah. So okay. we get a report for Hugh Howie's Wool World every month that lists all the people who wrote stories in that world and like who the top guy is, you know, so he can reach out and say, hey, thanks for, you know, doing such a great job. So it's, it's really kind of a fun community building thing, but the author does have a lot of right if in the contract, so they can say, um, you know, you, you can't do this with this character, you can't do this with that character, you can't be um, violent or sexually explicit or, you know, this and that. So the author has some control there. Some other hands? But um, is there any book that you'd recommend that could take us new writers from the baseline, where the history of publishing into all the options that's really current, that would bring us up to somewhere where we're, uh, where I'm understanding all the stuff you're talking about? Got any recommendations? So a book recommendation to help new writers kind of get a jump start on the publishing world? Yeah, understanding where it's been and where it's going. And What's so the, the new world? Um, I'll make a couple of recommendations. One is A Newbie's Guide to Publishing by J.A. Conrath. Uh, that one starts where he has been doing stuff through a traditional publisher and it follows as he started doing the self-publishing. And so it kind of follows that. The other book that I have to get, uh, um, everybody in here needs to get, go buy it tonight, and that is Discoverability by Chris Rush over here. Okay? It is a book that you have to have. Discoverability? Thank you. Discoverability. Well, Conrath's blog. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. And also I've got to plug Dean Wesley Smith's Think Like a Publisher because it will teach you, you know, how a lot of the stuff that we assume about books came about and it will tell you what you can and can't do. The problem with all of the books that we've written over the years, those of us who are writing about the new world, is that it, it was current for whatever year we put it out in and now it's all a little dated. And so, you know, it's, that's how fast things are changing. I'm, I'm, they're changing this week. So, you know, you've got to keep that in mind when you're getting books. That's why I think the recommendation to read blogs is a really good one because there will be times when you're just going to have to update some of your knowledge. Yeah. So, there's something good about knowing where we've been as, as a community to understand where we're going and the differences so you can see what people are doing old school and what they're doing new world stuff. What's really cool is if you go far back enough in, in publishing history, go back 100 years or so, you'll find out that there's nothing new under the sun. 
the arguments that we've been having were the argue about ebooks and hardcover were the same arguments that were being had about paperback when it started coming in. You know, the, the pulps, the stuff that write too much discoverability. There was not a lot of stuff in the 30s where you couldn't, writers were wondering how people could find them. It's all there, it just had a different code on. And it's really fascinating when you go back there. And then you, I find that if knowing the history of publishing makes me less surprised by some of the new stuff that comes in, which is really nice. Thank you. Any other? Go ahead. Sorry. Nope. Okay. Anyone else? Um, with the new world of publishing, has besides the obvious like internet and that kind of thing, um, promoting and marketing changed or changed much? Well, let me, let me quickly say, and then I'll let Gary say, yeah. And uh, I used to, I've, I've been telling people lately that if you want to learn a craft, um, you go to the old timers. Those of us who've been doing it for a long time, um, some of the big bestsellers, you know, people like that, they know more about craft in their little finger than, than almost anybody else is ever going to learn. But if you want to learn discoverability, you want to learn how to, how to market yourself in the modern world, go to the new indie writers and see what they're doing and try it because there's so much new stuff, and it's not just the internet. They're putting, because they're indie, they're putting business practices on there. I checked it back. The reason that you don't see book ads on television is because in the 1960s, a book publisher tried two markets by putting an ad on the New York market and the Washington DC market, and it didn't sell any books. So that's why that myth that book ads don't work on television came about. And you know, James Patterson did it in the 90s, and everybody said, well, he's James Patterson. And now new writers are doing all kinds of stuff that, you know, my bent after being 30 years in publishing is, you can't do, wait a minute, they're doing it, they're successful. Never mind, how are you doing that? <laughs> um, so, you know, you've got, a lot of these old myths are, are changing because people with a business mind are saying, well, I'm not gonna believe you that that doesn't work, let me try it. And so there's a lot of cool stuff happening. Yeah, the big thing is newsletters. If you don't have a newsletter, you need to get one set up. And I recommend not calling it a newsletter. People don't want newsletters. Mine is the preferred reader list. It's the same thing, but people are more likely to sign up for a preferred reader list. You can build your own book club if you do that. You get enough people to sign up. These are people who want to read your book. They want to hear from you. They want to know when your next release is out. So you let them sign up for that. Ideally, give them a free book, a free ebook when they sign up and that, something like that, where they have something of value that you're giving to them and you can really build a, a list a lot easier and a lot faster. Other than that, pay attention to whatever the romance writers are doing. Romance writers are the best marketers on the planet. And have been since the early 80s. They are just phenomenal. Uh, if you have an opportunity, Josh Viola is here uh, and, and Dean Wyatt, and they have started a small press called Hex Publishing. Uh, their first anthology is just out in September, Aaron Michael Ritchie has a story in it, Gary Jonas has a story in it. Um, he is, uh, he's doing this because he loves books and he loves stories and he just wants to dive in with both feet. So he's doing some really innovative stuff. They're doing a reading tonight from 10 to midnight with some of the authors. Uh, but he's in the dealer room, you'll see huge Hex Publishers banners. One of the things he did is he did an ad um, with AMC Theaters. So over the month of October, his book trailer would play. He has good, he has really good friends who are amazing artists, and they did this really cool book trailer. So that was playing in movie theaters. Another thing he did was use that artist to create a PlayStation 3 theme, which sells for 99 cents. And he's already had like how many thousands of downloads of that PlayStation theme with with the title Nightmares Unhinged of the anthology. I mean, he, he's really branching out of the book box. Like we think, oh, we publish, you know, we market to book people. He's marketing to much wider audiences and, and he's having a lot of fun with it. I, and that's what I was gonna say, is you can read all the books and blogs, but ultimately you want to think outside the box. It's actually such an amazing time to be a writer because you can use that creativity with the marketing and promotion. If you think of something that you think, oh, this is wild, like nobody's done this, try it. Um, I was with a romance writer at a signing down in Houston 
who had all these cute like love recipes that she was handing out on postcards and everybody loved them and I wanted to go make it right away. It's like, oh cool. So and it was just something that she thought of because she also was creative in terms of cooking. So whatever your strengths are, or if you have friends with strengths in certain areas, like graphic design and things like that, use that. Think outside the box, but it's such an amazing time right now to be an indie writer. And I think on that note, that's a good way to close things. I'd like everybody to thank our panel here. Thank you for all